The, the difference between the written word and the spoken word. If you go on the website of foreign affairs on the Middle East peace process, we're at one with the international community. 242338, Israel security, two state, Israel and Palestine living in peace and harmony and security, 1967 borders. It's in there. But if you recall, when uh, after the, at the APAC conference in the US, when President Obama talked about the 1967 border as the starting base, uh, the very first day after, uh, the Prime Minister of Canada rebuked him. Arab and Israel, because we lived that. 60 or 80 percent of our cash flow at one time was coming from Yemen. And we courageously structured a joint venture in the oil sands for a multi-billion dollar investment with an Israeli company. We did our homework. We were a little worried about this, but both ventures worked just fine and had no impact on one another. So maybe business can lead. Great. Thank you, Martha. Thank you all. And uh, just to save time, may I ask you all to consider that I've said all the thank you that are required in the circumstance, and I can move on directly to the, the text itself, which I will not read. Of course, I have a text here, but uh, I have notes here, and then I have another paper in my pocket. Uh, you know, so much thing have been said so far that I, I want to first to thank Paul for having finally agreed that uh, age before beauty, and therefore at my age, I'll take the credit any time. Uh, I'd like a few more pictures to be taken, that's all. Um, given the amount of stuff that we've covered, I'd like to focus more specifically on Canada and the implication. For once, I'm going to obey Martha and try and uh, adhere to her mantra. That sounds nice, Martha's mantra. Uh, but let me start first with a few, a few facts. You know, from a Canadian perspective, the region has never been really a, a major priority barring, of course, Israel, the import of Israel, if only just in terms of economic terms, because we have more than $2 billion trade with Israel on a year-to-year -year basis. But I think the region has always been considered a pain at best uh, in, in terms of all the concern and preoccupation for our global security. But it has never been looked at in a kind of a broad priority terms. And yet, you know, a, a few years ago, the, the CEO of, uh, of uh, GE International said at a conference that after China and India, he considered that the Middle East was the most important uh, region of the world from a business perspective, because after all, 280 million customers, more than 2 trillion globally of a GDP, that's a big, 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 big market. Now, from a Canadian perspective, we know that we have about 500,000 uh, Canadian of Arab origin, however you define as broad Arab it is. Uh, and the Jewish community is, uh, according to the latest assessment of the economist, 375,000. So you're talking about about very important communities. And in fact, in 2008, our total uh, two-way trade was about $20 billion. So we're talking important figures here. The investment of Canada exceeds uh, $3 billion. And in fact, in fact the, the Middle Eastern holding in Canada exceeds $6 billion. So, and just for Marta now, you know, it's not for you, but Marta, in Cairo, there's five second cups. So in case you don't have enough, just go there. <laughs> And, um, you know, in terms of the importance, if today's situation, a lot of investors may be sitting on the fence, but they won't be sitting very long because between 2010 and 2035, the, the demand for energy is going to increase by one third. And 90% of that one third will come from the Middle East and North Africa region. So there's not much time for the business community to sit on the fence. Now, to what extent the, the change, to what extent the Arab Spring has brought a lot of change? Well, my view is that the region is in fact far more important today since the Arab Spring than it was even before. And I hope that some leaders in this country will listen to that. You know, it's actually more important for me than the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. But the problem is we always look at it in a very short time capsule when in fact we should give the region all the time, as some people said, the slack. Look at Russia, for instance, 20 years in the making. And if you're in love with Putin, well then go to another room. Um, the, 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 the sad fact is that it's not just Canada which is not really engaged. The whole of the West is not engaged uh, compared to what we did for the Eastern Europe and, and the, the Soviet Union moving into Russia. Uh, granted, it's the financial economic crisis is a nice excuse, but it's not good enough. I think it also has to do with an enormous amount of ignorance that we have of the region and also a feeling of a disarray 
we don't understand what's going on. That's why this conference is useful, but we should have more governmental people there. But you haven't succeeded on that one, Martha. It's okay, we'll forgive you. Uh, you know, what is also upsetting for a lot of people in this area is the pace of change and also the fact that the change is not mon mon monolithical. That's very annoying for government. You know, there's crisis in, 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 in Syria, which is horrifying, and then you have this nice move in Tunisia. That's not a package that is very easy to manage. So, Anyway, I think that's a very sad fact that we're not more involved in that. Now, why should we pay attention to the MENA region? MENA, Middle East, North Africa, is everybody after five days here? Five days? Anyway, we should all know what we're talking about. You know, the, the energy equation is very important. And there's one question which has never been answered. And I'm not sure I have an answer. But for instance, how long will a country like China will accept to have oil price volatility and supply even held hostages by, say, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. At one stage, when an actor like China start pulling its weight, not the way as tailing gate for Russia, but actually have its own policy to ensure that maybe there's some progress made on that. I don't know. But it's clear that the stability that we all call for in the region depends on regional security, on the peace process. And I know there's no peace and there's no process, but I'm paid by the government to say that, <laughs> even though I'm no longer in government. Uh, you also have the, the need for rule of law. Now, I'm not sure that Canada realizes what its interests are and how, and yesterday it was very beautifully said, I can't match that, but I'll try and repeat it in my own words, how its value actually coincide with its policies. And I agree with Paul and others on that, absolutely. Now, we always have a nice talk about fostering development, security, stability. But you know, the impact, the impact of what we do well, like for instance, and yesterday there was a question about that, the contribution we make to Palestinian security system reform is actually the, the real contribution we make. We've put $300 million over five years on that thing, but we're not talking about, you know, it's, it's just too good so we don't brag about it. But, but you know, that kind of contribution is negated by our bias towards Israel. And in, as I said, very little light is made of our contribution. We also have, and, and I'm, I'm sorry to say, but I'm, I'm, Akiva is gone, but you know, we have a nice talk about our effective role in the Middle East peace process. The gavel, hey, come on, the gavel is this old stuff. We pay lip service to it, but there's not going to be a, a gavel for Canada until something really happens in the region. So, and we're not going to make a real effort until that happens. Now, we all agree that there are two single most important issue in that is the cause of instability in the region. And it's, of course, first and foremost, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, or as, as somebody else said, the Israeli-Arab conflict. But it's, the, it's, it's more than the, cause, the, the, the reason for insecurity. I think one of, one of the elements that has not been highlighted in the conference is that that conflict is also responsible for the underdevelopment of the region, underdeveloped in all terms, economic, social, political, dictatorship, you name it. And it's not just military spending. So it's a, it's, and then the second issue, of course, is Iran. But I say Iran as defined in Western terms. This being said, I do not question the fact that many Arab countries in the region are somewhat worried about what happens in Iran. But the way we define it, define it the, the height of, of, of the crisis that we try to manage it. And those two issues have actually been uh, affected by the Arab Spring, uh, in, notably because of the easy stalemate imposed on the Middle East peace process, and of course, the diversion of the focus on Iran. Now, the region has many other issues that I will not deal with in terms of problem in which Canada plays actually a more modest role, not really well known in terms of economic development, in terms of governance, in terms of working on the structural weaknesses and education. And actually, CEDA has not done that bad a job, mind you. Uh, Mrs. Oda has gone, so I won't say anything more. Um, but let me just focus on the Canadian response on, on, on the Middle East peace process and on Iran and, in, and the Arab Spring in general. Um, what is striking, and I'm going, because I'm being careful, because I've just left government, so I'm only going to use open source, not my own source, because mine are not open anyway. Uh, the, the difference between the written word and the spoken word. If you go on the website of foreign affairs on the Middle East peace process, 
We're at one with the international community. 242338, Israel security, two state, Israel and Palestine living in peace and harmony and security, 1967 borders. It's in there. But if you recall, when, uh, after the, at the APAC conference in the US, when President Obama talked about the 1967 border as the starting base, uh, the very first day after, uh, the Prime Minister of Canada rebuked him. It's only very recently that Mr. Baird, feeling somewhat more confident in his position than his predecessors, plural, 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 <laughs> has decided to talk about the 1967 border. So there is progress, so we can take a deep breath. Um, you know, we've also condemned the settlements and all that, and East Jerusalem as capital, all that is there. But in practice, in practice, the focus has always been on the security of Israel. We've been extraordinarily quiet on settlement. And in fact, we have, pardon me, the highest authority of the country has been extraordinarily quiet uh, on Palestine. And I'll read you a text because I'm not supposed to talk about texts that I know. So I will only talk to you about the Qatari officials' comment at the Forum of the Future. Now, I hope you all know what the Forum of the Future is. It's the Bemina, this group that was launched by the US and that we've been party to. The Qatari official comment is the following. Canada's inflexibility and insistence on not including a reference to Palestine. Can you imagine the Forum of the Future deals with the broad Middle East and North Africa region, and the communique was not supposed to have a single reference to Palestine. Is there something wrong with that picture? Just tell me if you don't understand it. Canada's inflexibility in the system on not including a reference to Palestine has stalled efforts to issue a communique at the end of the Forum of the Future. Now, and I've heard rumors that th similar thing happened at some other international organized uh, meeting that, that was held. So the practice goes contrary to, uh, to, the, to the actual text. And of course, at the UN, which by the way, uh, Paul was very right in highlighting that. It's uh, indeed Paul Martin who started the process, but was it ever picked up in high speed by the successors? Uh, this, you know, this, the, the, the vote at the UN and the, this perennial sentence that, oh, we are voting against this resolution because it is unfairly singling out Israel. Well, the problem is that the singling out of Israel is somewhat justified by the facts on the ground. But, hey. We're all very honest. So let me also say a few words about Iran. Now, first of all, let's be clear. Uh, Iran does pose a problem, OK? So I'm not dupe. I'm not naive. It does pose a real problem. But there's also a need to understand a bit the Iranian. The Iranian are totally paranoid. And they're, they're, it's true that they're hiding stuff. It's absolutely true. Um, and, and they don't like the IAEA, which is seen as an instrument of the great Satan supported by the small Satan, which is called Israel. That's fine and all that. But we, we have legitimate concern about Iran. But the point is, and I, I'm going to make it very short, the, they don't have the bomb yet. Has anybody seen an Iranian bomb recently? No, they don't have it. And the question is, what are they trying to do? Are they trying to get the capacity to build one or in order to have this kind of additional weight in the region, or are they actually going to build it? At this stage, none of us know exactly what is going on. And by the way, were they to have one, when would it actually even become a real threat for the region? It's going to take a hell of a time for them to even build an arsenal. And if ever there was the starting of a building of an arsenal, I think that, that would get the international community to, to react big and fast. Now, I've, talked, I've said that. Those, there are so many uncertainties. And yet, we seem to be dealing with Iran as if we were certain of absolutely everything. You know, we, we've, we, I'm, again, our prime minister reads the minds of the Iranian leaders. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm quoting here. The prime minister said at one stage, he suggests he had absolutely no doubt Iran would use nuclear weapon, quote, if they see them achieving their religious or political purposes. That was on Peter's Mandridge on the National. So, um, you know, mind readers, I'm sorry. This being said, Iran is a problem on the human rights. We all agree on that one. And uh, Canada has been very forceful in terms of imposing the sanction like the rest of the international community, and there's a, you know, we hope that something will happen on it. Uh, on the Arab Spring, uh, again, the Canada has been more sitting on the fence 
And we didn't develop a long-term vision on it. And in fact, again, because I think as a former bureaucrat, it's good to quote my own prime minister, uh, he's been pretty candid about his own views about it. Quote, there are obviously forces who want democracy and progressive change. That's a nice part. But there are clearly some forces that would want something that's probably worse than what we had before. That's a policy. So um, I will not make any further comment. Um, now the question is, uh, yeah, we've, we've also did a bit of economic support, but very, rather minimal and no engagement. So my, my, my proposal now is to look at very rapidly, in the limited time still allowed to me, the next uh, 25 minutes, um, <laughs> what, um, you see, that, that's to cool off her and her at the same time. So that's brilliant. Uh, what response Canada should be give? Well, first of all, for the region, I think given you know, given even our economic success and all that, I think we've got a role in trying to rekindle within the G8 and the G20 an interest in the region. Absolutely, you know, we, we, we've got, and, and Paul said it so much better than I could, but, you know, we've got to develop a policy of vision for the region and trying to impart it to our colleagues and, and, and really help develop the awareness and the knowledge of the region rather than look and say, oh, these are, you know, we don't understand the Arabs. You know, we don't. No, we don't. Um, and, and we've got to also stop being reactive. That, that's the key problem we have. We seem to be always reacting to events. And one of the things that I had suggested to Minister Fast, and I can, that I can say because I was no longer in government when I told him, I said, you know, one of the nice gestures we could do is, but with very strong you know, condition, is for instance propose to a country like Egypt to have a free trade agreement. That would be an interesting way to mobilize a real productive dialogue with that country. Oh, yeah, but free trade with the Muslim Brotherhood. No, 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 no. One of the things also is the Arab League from the nondescript organization that was before is now becoming a more serious actor. And I, I lament the media who were saying, oh, look at that, they were unsuccessful in Syria and all that. Nobody's successful in Syria. But under Nabil al Arabi, the new Secretary General, he's really trying to create a real organization. And I actually to ask him whether he'd be interested in having support in, in, in the institutional building, and he said he would certainly not throw it away. Uh, I haven't seen much uh, take on that, but let's hope. Now, on the Middle East peace process, I think it's very simple. We should match our words to the policy that we have announce and show more evenness. I think we have given the so-called great influence we have on Israel. I think we should encourage Netanyahu to embrace it rather than embrace the Arab Spring. Um, now, here, okay, agnostic, please, we stand. Why, why, why oppose the observer status for Palestine at the UN like the Vatican? You know, it's I know all the arcanes of the UN. Only Paul knows more than I do on that. I've been Director General of International Organization. I, you know, I won't go into the deep of that. But, you know, if you are really espouse the concept, the right of the Palestinian to a state, that is not that bad a gesture to put forward. And despite all the comments that some of uh, others have, some have made here about, yes, it's true that uh, Obama had the wrong tack on settlement. Yes, he should have focused on the border. But I think a freeze on settlement remains absolutely essential because the facts on the ground are, are getting, starting to imperil completely even the defining of the border. So I think that the freeze still should be called for as a matter of principle, as a matter of international law, as a matter of decency, as a matter of whatever you want to look at it, but it's absolutely essential. Now, there's two psychological points that are important on that. Also, I think if, if there was some real negotiation going on, on the Israeli side towards the Palestinian in general. I think it would have a very positive impact on what I call the deplorable and yet growing delegitimization and demonization of Israel. And I think the Israel are doing themselves a huge disservice on that account. The, the, and we were talking about that with Ali this morning at, at breakfast. I think we had, we're on the same page on that one. And we have to accredit the notion that you know, Israel will be more secure when there will be a Palestinian state. Now, on Iran, quickly, and I'll conclude on that, I promise, Marta, another promise of mine. Um, on Iran, 
it's the very simple fact is that you know encouraging the Israel and other countries not to go into Malbrook um, Salvatan guerre and bomb bomb this whole stuff about bombing is just insane but it is taking a spin that is unbelievable um, and and by the way anything we do to b beef up the real dialogue, the real negotiation of the peace process would remove uh, 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 one propaganda instrument from the Iranian toolbox, so that would be used. One of the things also we have to do, uh, because we, we can take the fight within, is to make more use of our own model of, of, tolerance, of tolerance, of pluralism, to actually, and, and we should encourage our Western partners here, I'm talking about the Western, I'm not talking about mingling into the, 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 the perceptions of, of the Arab world, is, is to show greater openness and more understanding towards Islam. And, and we have the instrument. You know, the McGill Institute of Islamic Studies, for instance, has been doing some stellar work for 30 years, with particularly in Indonesia. Uh, a lot of the, the scholars from, from Indonesia, the PhD, are all PhD from McGill, and, and the dialogue with them is an extraordinary dialogue of comprehension and understanding. Uh, I think that, again, to avoid uh, you know, fostering the Iranian attraction, I think the more we do economic assistance to the Arab Spring country who have shown moderation and a desire to develop would certainly be helpful. Uh, and by the way, one thing we've got to make clear, I know people won't like that, but we should be very clear that we are not we are not trying to foster a regime change in Iran. Let the Iranians do it. Let the Iranians do it. We, 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 we're not there because we'll just hype the, uh, their, their paranoia. And we should, yeah, promise, one more minute. Um, <laughs> it is true. The, um, and I think we should take a bit of perspective on Iran, on, on our, our fixation. You know, the media and Israel have been hyping it far too much. So, two more caveats. Uh, we should certainly try and highlight the folly of uh, having the, the, even the thought of an Arab common front against Iran or inflaming, of course, of Shia and Sunni tensions. And we should rethink our control engagement policy. We'll have our red lines, but I think it's time we start discussing in earnest with the Iranian. And recognize that Iran has legitimate security concern, whether it's Afghanistan, drugs, Iraq, Syria, and all of that. And final question, which I will not answer. And what would we do with an Iranian nuclear? I can tell you, my thought is that it could still be less worrisome than Pakistan. Thank you. We have a role. Oh, what a difficult act to follow. You know, we're a country of incredible, incredible opportunities, incredible people. And when we hear the speakers just before us for the last three and a half days, I wish I could summarize in the right and proper way everything that has been said. What each of you have spoken about over the past three and a half days is what business needs to hear. It's the people that lay the ground. It's the people that give their heart and soul it's the people that believe, and it's the people that want to go forward. So to each of you, thank you. And what can we say to our military and our governments? Again, thank you for being there. Be there. I've now been asked to segue into the daunting subject of business opportunities following the Arab Spring. You know, it's a challenge, a challenging subject that could take two, three months just even sit down and talk about. So this will be embarrassingly short on my behalf, and I shall just try and cover a few points, and it will be observations of my past, I believe it's been called decades, uh, <laughs> which is really shattering. I didn't quite realize it was that long. But um, looking back from my first run into Saudi Arabia, and it was indeed invited by the Saudis and with the Department of Foreign Affairs Canada that supported this. This, is, this was a little awkward moment, taking a, um, a female um, into Saudi Arabia. And, and um, Martha asked if I just quickly note on this, 
when I was asked to do this, and it was uh, the, the it came through the Department of Foreign Affairs and came uh, to me to carry through on this. And I said, oh, I'd be delighted, and I'm afraid I was a little light on my response because I didn't believe it was true. I said, I'll be delighted, delighted to go if someone pays my way, and if, in fact, Saudi gives me a visa, knowing that I, Department of Foreign Affairs was not going to pay my way, and uh, Saudi most probably would not give me a visa. It took half an hour. And um, I came back, I paid my way. Uh, actually, the company I work for paid my way. And uh, I received a visa from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And this was all quite wonderful until I arrived in Riyadh. And uh, going through the uh, customs area, the clearance area, uh, there was a marked surprise by the customs officers as they looked at my visa and um, immediately stopped me. Now, of course, my visa said I was a man. <laughs> Women weren't allowed to travel on their own in, in Saudi. Actually, it's uh, still somewhat limited at uh, the moment as well, but definitely not at that time. And so I was bounced along from post to post, and they didn't know quite what to do with me, but fortunately, uh, someone took kindly, and I got through. But it happened on the way out as well. My visa still said I was a man, and it still said I was leaving, and obviously I didn't quite look like the guys that were lined up with me. Um, if I look at my personal and unusual reference for international business opportunities in this part of the world, I refer to this as the world of soft borders. And I do this because business crosses borders, and it's gone on for centuries in uh, the MENA region, and it will continue to go on for centuries. And we, as Canadians, have to recognize this. We can view this um, ourselves by putting up barriers and borders, or we can choose to soften those borders, and we can achieve success. Everything that we do in this part of the world, as in business, more so here, it's attitudes, it's expectations, and it's perceptions. Borders are not stringent. They're not walls to keep us out. However, there's a huge risk, and it's balanced with a decorum of respect, and this is essential at all levels of, governing, of government, and it includes a business culture, and it includes a social culture, and both those are very important if you're going to do business in this part of the world. In countries of unrest, I'll make the comment and observation that I believe we should stay out until such time as non-corporate sectors are invited to work with countries to rebuild. Then we should work with governments at the appropriate levels and go in where and when we can support that. All companies that go in there, we have to be serious. We have to be very committed, and we have to have trust. Canadians tend to kick tires when we go overseas. We go in and we say, oh, we're wonderful. We have this great technology. We have this knowledge. We can do that. And we wheel in, and we wheel out, and we go on missions. And we forget. We have to have a continuance. We have to build relationships. And this is going to be extremely difficult in the times that are going on right now. The relationships that will be at a governing level will not be the relationships that may endure. These will be a transitional relationship. It will be a flexible relationship. Most likely, there will be two governing bodies that will be in a transitional period. We can't choose because they may not be there, but we have to build carefully on the depth of those that are there to build our ongoing relationships. As Canadians, I also have to remind us, we aren't the only people that deal in technology, knowledge, 
tangible assets, or financing. We will be judged in how we penetrate the soft borders, and we will be accepted on that. Regretfully, you and your companies and you and your organizations, and these are universities and hospitals and all not-for-profits that are looking at expanding their business. There are thousands of other individuals and companies that are out there doing exactly the same thing that you do that we do. They're just as good at it as we are. We're better in some areas, but we have to have the confidence to go out there and again and again go after business and repeat ourselves. Companies will lead. Companies go after business. And they go after it with a very solid, knowledgeable base. They do an awful lot of due diligence before they go. They identify how best to expand their business opportunities to meet their mandate, and you've heard it all before, to answer to their shareholders. They will look at security of expanding business. They'll look at security of their personnel, both domestic and their expats, the people that they take in with them. They're just as concerned about the people that they hire in country as they are about the people that come in. I'd also offer an observation that when you do take off and do business in this part of the world at no matter what level, before you walk out the door, it's $250,000. Nobody ever wants to hear that. That's just to walk out the door and take a good solid look at where we're going to go. Make sure you have the support of your corner office. This is extremely important in corporations. You're often seen when you take off, oh my gosh, they're staying in a nice hotel, they're flying business class, they're going to sleep all the way over, and they're going to get to tour all the countries. I can't tell you how many countries I've been in, and I still want to go back and be a tourist. It just doesn't work like that. So you have to build internal relationships with your new own area, and you have to keep building those, and you have to have the support of the corner offices. And did I happen to mention price competitive? We have to be price competitive internationally, not just sitting with our own budgets and our own business plan at home. It just doesn't work like that. And it all sounds so simple, doesn't it? But it's not. Oh, did I happen to mention patience, patience, and more patience? That in itself is key. We have enormous opportunities in this transition building period. We as Canadians are seen as non-aggressive, safe, experienced, educated. We have resounding knowledge. We can take on almost any subject you want to talk to us. We're leaders in the broad-based energy sector. We have a very strong uh, focus on the supply side right across the country. Training, infrastructure production, processing. Do you know what we really lack? We lack the pizzazz of our neighbors to the south. We don't sell ourselves. We are capital C conservative Canadians. I don't mean that politically. <laughs> <laughs> the Middle East companies, private or government, are quick observers. These are business people. They have been in business for centuries. When I first started going over there, nobody had a secretary coming behind them taking notes. They didn't have Blackberries. They didn't have laptops. There wasn't a conversation forgotten from our earliest conversations. These are business people. So they know how to judge. They're really quick observance, observers. Are we serious? Are we coming back? Do we have something to add to what they have? Are we a proven entity? It's irrelevant if you're a small, medium, or large company. As long as you bring something relevant to increase or improve an existing business, a new opportunity, or a return on their investment. 
and in all cases, employment of local personnel. And if you can bring in the under 25, you even get more stars on the list. It's fine for Canadian companies to go overseas, but there's a very strong government role, and we have to balance this. Canadians do not enjoy the history that other countries have, such as the United States, France, Germany, Japan, China, Norway, Denmark. They have government elected officials, senior bureaucrats, that support them in their endeavors when, they, when business goes off out of country. We don't. However, Government has a huge role and should have a strong visual presence in the countries that Canadian companies are investing and that are recipients of contracts. We must take, a, we must take as business a role and support that Canadian presence in out-of-country places. We should be doing it with our embassies, They've got to be strong, our personnel experienced and knowledgeable, and the right numbers of people to carry out the services that we all require. We won't be taken seriously if our governments cannot carry out their roles and have a strong presence. And as business, we have a strong, strong responsibilities to support government to ensure that our embassies have that. Governments must align with business associations. I'm now wearing my Canada Arab Business Council hat. These are the individuals and the companies that know where the opportunities are. Government just can't align with big business. There's a balance between associations and business. Otherwise, they will internalize. The Canada Air Business Council, and I'm a little like selling in a non-volunteer organization as well as you are here. And we count on the support of business. We count on the support of government. We, support, we stand on the support of individuals. As we go through, government is essential, and I'm really pushing this because we're a team. Government's essential for the groundwork for industry. They provide industry with the status of what is happening on a day-to-day -day in that country. And now that we're talking the aftermath of the Arab Spring, this is really key. We aren't over there as business, but government is, so we will rely on them. They can offer good information on who is in power and who is not in control. It's absolutely essential for Canadian companies to have on the ground knowledge of safety because we aren't going to send our people anywhere unless they're safety for our personnel. We have to know what the social order is, what's the new system, government to government, the protocol, the business rules. Is there a banking system, a financial relationship? What's the establishment? What's the risk factor? What's the transitional government? And we can go at this on and on, and I know you want me to cut down as well. I want to come over quickly on the business side. Industry will take the risk to expand business. They will lead on this, and government is important. I'm being redundant. We're looking for a return on investment. That's essential. And how does this work? This has to be on a team. The Arab Spring countries, this is what's key, they have the resources to pay for a rebuilding. You take a look at Libya, yes, strong resource, and they indeed, I believe, are in my believe at this point, my observation is there's huge opportunities for us to start to initiate working with government and to invest back in that country, especially on the contract basis and large concessions. The oil and gas is still there. The fields haven't moved. Um, pipelines are still functional, and they are going to honor the contracts for concession holders. So there's huge opportunities for service companies to work with, with resource companies and going back in. Hospitals 
education, universities. There's a huge infrastructure potential there for consulting, enormous opportunities. Syria, I mentioned earlier, I think we were, we're in a wait and see and we're, when we're asked to go in. Tunisia. We've had limited opportunities in Tunisia over the years. It's more in small manufacturing and it's the agriculture area. Bahrain, I just came back from Bahrain. Good opportunities there with the gas. They want to expand some opportunities on that. Um, not in the oil, obviously. Hospitals, they're looking at expansion of two hospitals and they have the financial su support by which to go in. And it's a very comfortable environment to be in, by the way. Yemen, I'm not going to comment, my colleagues' area. Egypt, we've been there as manufacturers, we've been there in Alexandria, more working in uh, plants, uh, technology area, large, large in education. And I think given the uh, uh, transition time, we will have an opportunity of going back in there within the name six to eight months. Ladies and gentlemen, I do want to close. I know I have one minute. I'm going to say one thing. The Canada Air Business Council has been asked to participate in a Government of Canada establishment, Department of Foreign Affairs. Thirteen priority uh, countries that DFAT sets up. When uh, on a conference call, uh, it was last week, no one, there isn't one country from the uh, MENA region. We're writing a paper on supporting the MENA region as one of the 13 priority areas. We would look forward to hearing from you and having your support on that. I will close by saying it's a marvelous place to work in MENA region. Lots of things to happen. Good people. The most important thing to my Arab friends, they're just like us. Family's key. The extended family is key. The right to believe is key. And the right to support their family is key. It's just like your next door neighbor here. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. I am convinced that I have been asked to be the last speaker before lunch because I am the briefest. <laughs> and I see someone's going to start their uh, stopwatch here. Let me begin by just uh, thanking the organizers for inviting me uh, here today. I realize how risky it is to stand between you and lunch. I have learned so many things listening to the speakers here for the last three days. But the newest thing I picked up is how many strategies people have for avoiding the hook when their time is up. I clearly, I clearly have developed a new portfolio of skills in, uh, in that area. I think the one I like the best is deny, 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 just like Colin Thatcher. The clock's not running. No, it's... Uh, And our panel had a particularly unique problem. When your moderator is the future Prime Minister of Canada, you should pay attention to the hook. I think you, have, you may have some fans here, uh, Martha, and you deserve them. Um, I've spent uh, the last 32 years of my career as an engineer uh, and a businessman. And it's that perspective that I want to try to bring to what it takes for Canadian companies to create success, primarily internationally. Um, now, the components I'm going to talk about are going to focus on the Arab world. They're going to focus on Nexon's experience in uh, Yemen. But I think they apply to a lot of businesses, and I think they apply to a lot of other countries as well. The first thing about international development is any country you go to wants more than just the taxes, the revenues, the royalties, 
that you bring from your business or from your resource development. They want jobs, they want advancement, they want to pick up some know-how about what you're doing, and they want some control. So one of the first things we did when we went to a lot of these countries is we spent time figuring out how to fit in, how to make sure that we could abandon some of our Western paradigms and fit into their, their cultures, fit into their business, their, fit into their ways of doing things. That is so easy to say, it is so tough to do. Uh, to give you one, ex one example is when we went to Yemen, they had no indigenous oil and gas industry there, so to begin with, 0% of our employees were Yemeni. By the time we left 25 years later, 95% of 1,000 employees were Yemeni nationals. We gave them English language training, we gave them technical training, and one of the hallmarks of our success was when we lost one of our employees to another Gulf producer because they were qualified. We thought we're doing a good job there. To be successful internationally, and I think in, in any business ventures, you have to have courage, you've got to have persistence, you've got to have patience, you have to have some serendipity. And I'm going to spend a few minutes telling you about the story of how we got into Yemen. So Nexon was, uh, at that time, a company that had a major shareholder. It was an American shareholder, an American oil company called Occidental. They had a concession in Yemen, and they couldn't drill it because there were sanctions against it. So we were the subsidiary. We were the teenage kid. And they said, teenage kid, go drill this concession. And we said, we're this tiny little Canadian company. We don't know anything about this country. There aren't any good hotels there. <laughs> in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of a desert. It was a very risky prospect. Are you kidding? We're not going to go drill it. So the debate went back and forth. The debate went back and forth. We thought it was risky. They thought it was good. We drilled it. And then the view would be is that all we did was count money afterwards. But we had a discovery. It was a very exciting discovery, but it was small. It was in the middle of nowhere. And we were worried there wasn't quite enough oil to pay out the facilities to build the infrastructure for power generation, for roads, for pipelines, for an export terminal, for all the tankage. So we drilled a few more wells, and we still didn't want to develop it, but our major shareholder pushed us, and we did it. First thing we had was a cost overrun. It cost us three times more than we thought it would. The government of the day was very unhappy because it was a cost recovery contract. So we got our cost back first before they got the lion's share of the oil. So it's not fun negotiating when someone puts a gun on the table. It creates a focus that uh, is uh, incredibly clarifying at times. <laughs> but we had a good discussion. We put the project uh, on stream, and I think something like 13 days after the project went on stream, the country goes into civil war. Does this sound like an easy business or a tough business? It's a very tough business. Small discovery, cost overrun, and you're in the middle of a civil war. We evacuate our employees. Luckily, we only lost uh, 13 hours of uh, production. Um, and the Yemeni were very practical. I think the war lasted for about nine months. And both sides knew the facilities were very important to the future of the country. So we had some immunity that the facilities wouldn't be damaged. At that time, we sold the oil and sent the money to the government for their share. So during the Civil War, we said, oh, this doesn't feel quite right. Because you're going to use this money for guns and all this bad stuff. So we put the money in escrow. Do you think that made him happy? <laughs> but the gun didn't come out again. Um, and we persisted, and a 100 million barrel discovery became a billion barrel discovery. The government made a lot of money, we made a lot of money, and it's a great international uh, success story. It's been the most stable contract in our entire portfolio of developed or undeveloped countries. Not a word in that contract has changed. Billions of dollars went through it. And at the end of each year, we used to squabble about a million dollars here or there. It was a big success. And we took some of that free cash flow from that country and put it back into Canada, into the oil sands business, into the shale business. So that's a story of how an international success project unfolds. And during this difficult period of time, it was three to four years when we thought we were going to lose our shirt and lose our company. Um, 
Moving on, when you listen carefully to what people say in countries when you go to them, you really can determine what you can do to help them along. So we noticed that a lot of uh, the women there, when they would come to work, they would come dressed in their hijabs and they would come to the office and they'd change into Western clothes and they'd dress in their veils and go home. And we asked them, why are you doing this? And they gave us a very good answer. It's just easier this way. So a lot of what you do in business is just practical. We uh, had two major facilities. We allowed locals to come and pick up water because we could produce potable water. We had two small medical clinics. We would allow locals to come and use those. And doing, doing some of the good work that you want to do can be hard and complicated. We started a scholarship program. We wanted to bring eight students to Canada each year, full ride, four year university degree. It took us two years to put in the selection criteria so this wouldn't be a sons and daughters of cabinet minister program. And then we wanted these young kids to go back to build their country. So guess what? After they adjust a couple of winners here, what do you think? <laughs> they maybe want to stay. So we had a lot, of, uh, a lot of work to do. But the government found that they had 800 qualified students that could successfully go to international uh, school and be successful. What are some of the barriers and what are some of the issues with development that we ran into? Number one, the suboptimal use of talent in a lot of these countries, especially women. So we tried to employ as many as we could. And we did things like build kindergartens, but we'd build them for girls because the boys had quite an advantage there. Number two, a lot of their primary education is religious-based versus fact-based and science-based. So we had to provide a lot of training, had to be patient. We brought in some Western-educated nationals. That worked well. Their bureaucratic skill levels and a lot of their bureaucracies, even when it's well-intentioned, is not the best at times. A lot of the talent there is relationship-based. It's not competency-based. How some of the public resources there are deployed, deployed is not optimal. And some of these countries have difficult creating just the basic conditions for businesses to function and to be successful. <clears throat> we would notice that political parties, the government, business and economic leaders, the security apparatus, religious leaders, and the judiciary were too closely linked. Sometimes this was like one big ball of stuff, and that wasn't efficient. And I'd argue that separating these in a lot of these countries would be much more important than giving people the vote. If we could have that done, to have that separation, I think you would find a lot better uh, functioning. And contrary to popular belief, these countries are not filled with nasty people who are rotten apples. They're more captivated to a system. And that would move me to my next topic, which is corruption. Corruption is endemic in a lot of these places. I don't believe it's related to individuals. It's related to the system they're in. And there's been a lot of psychological and sociological studies that'll show you that if the people in the room are placed into those systems, guess what? 90% 90, 90 of us plus would wind up with the same type of behavior. This is one of the reasons that it's so tough to deal with this issue. And you can do business without paying bribes. Number one, it's wrong. Number two, it's ineffective. And if you do it, you're going to get into a lot of trouble. Um, relationship building, as Sandra mentioned, is very important. And you've got to do a good job of this. But you need to do relationship build with people who have a visceral understanding of these countries. And you need to trust these people. And that's so difficult to do, especially when you put a lot of money into these uh, countries. And for these folks to be effective, they actually have to have a foot in the other camp. This is very difficult for Western businesses to do when you take some risk. I think, Martha, the analogy is would be a liberal trusting Mr. Harper. You've got to do that sometimes to be successful. I want to spend a few seconds on risks and uncertainty in these business, businesses, because the perception is that international businesses are structurally more risky than domestic businesses. Sometimes that's true and sometimes it's not. I gave you an example. It's the most stable contract we had in our portfolio. 
in every Western country we developed it. Taxes went up, taxes went down, royalties went up, royalties went down, no influence. And in our business, once you stick your money in the ground, you are stuck. You are captive. You cannot take your toys and move them and go home. So governments are extraordinarily powerful in what they can do to you once you have uh, put your assets uh, on the ground. But when you go into international businesses, one of the big weaknesses is your Western frameworks sometimes handicap you. So you've got to do a lot of studying. You've got to do political stuff. You've got to do social stuff. You've got to listen to travelers, but you mostly have to listen to residents because they have this visceral understanding. And even after you do all of this, there's still a lot of uncertainty that's remaining. It's an uncertain world. And we control so much of our world that we believe we have mastery over it. This is fundamentally false. Nobody predicted oil was going to go to $150 a barrel. Nobody predicted it was going to crash to 35 nine months later. And nobody predicted it would recover to 100. But big businesses are supposed to be fortune tellers and soothsayers. We're not. Nobody predicted the financial crisis. So how many people in the room took all of the equities in their portfolio and translated them to cash in June of 2008? Not so many. How many took all of their cash and translated them into equities in March of 2009? There was a 100% return in those. You know, we, we've heard a lot about the Arab Spring, but some of the structurals that led to that, some of the structural forces that led to that were present in many of these countries for decades. Predicting when these things happen, I believe, is impossible. You can't find anybody who 30 years ago was writing that China was going to grow at 10% a year for 30 years. You would have said that in a room like this and someone would have given you a saliva test and throw you out. <laughs> so your only defense against some of this, and I think it's true in not only businesses but in other places, is Number one, to have flexibility. Number two, I'm going to get the flag right away. I can tell. Do I get the three-minute flag or the five-minute flag? The five-minute flag. I can finish before then. You have to have flexibility. You have to be adaptable. After the president of Yemen was, uh, was uh, a, the, there was an attempted assassination on him, bomb, I think nine people lost their lives. He was exiled to Saudi Arabia to get uh, recuperation. We quickly scrambled around and we were in touch with where folks were in the country and we figured out where the power structures might move. So I went to meet who was going to be the next vice president because he was coming to an American heart clinic and we found out about it and I was able to structure a meeting there. Businesses have to be adaptable. You can't figure this out all in advance. You can do some basic contingency planning but to believe you can predict the future, I think, is selling false stuff to your shareholders, to your boards of directors, and to the population. You have to pay attention to weak signals. And this is something that's easy to say and tough to do. Because usually before a problem like this erupts, there are some signals some places. And, and these are really clear in retrospect. And if any of you read the 9-11 Commission, you know, it seems that there were bells and, and whistles that were ringing loudly that this was going to happen. But to, read a weak signal and interpret it as especially difficult. So what can we as Canadians and what can host countries do to improve the opportunity that Canadian companies have? Number one, we don't need protection. We just need a little bit of cheering and a little bit of support. And Martha mentioned that when we went into Yemen at Peak production in that country, we produced one-third of the GDP of that country. One-third. And we could never convince Ottawa to open an embassy there. And we said, look, and wh why couldn't we? Well, it wasn't part of their strategic focus, their top-down strategic planning. And that's OK. Countries should have a decision of where they want to go. But when little guys like us find something pretty good, and we were there for 25 years, it's a great opportunity. We could have had an embassy in the region. It could have been a platform. And if the country didn't work out, well, you pack up your bags and go home. A typical new entry for an ENP company in international business is not 250000 For us, it's $100 million bucks. Buy some land, shoot some seismic, drill some wells, see if you can find 
something. So all we need is to have the government a little bit interested in bottom-up opportunities that companies find as well as a top-down strategy. When we went to China to look for investment money on the government strategic list, gosh, did we have great support, knowledgeable, capable people. All you have to do is, as Woody Allen shows, Woody Allen says is 80% of success in life is showing up. And it's not that complicated. Show up by yourself, show up with us, have some capability. For host countries, number one is security. We can't go places if our people get shot. Number two, and this seems so simple, but it's so difficult for a lot of countries. When we put our money in, we have to have confidence we can get it out, especially if we create success. We cannot deal with rule changes if we create success and if we have a dry hole, someone says that's capitalism. That model will not work. And this is such a basic problem in a lot of places. Other simple stuff, hire employees, fire employees, train employees, water, electricity, telephone, getting visas, getting stuff in and out of countries, importing and exporting is a big challenge in some of these places. And one brief comment, uh, my only comment on Arab and Israel is we lived that. 60 or 80 percent of our cash flow at one time was coming from Yemen and we courageously structured a joint venture in the oil sands for a multi-billion dollar investment with an Israeli company. We did our homework and we were a little worried about this but both ventures worked just fine and had no impact on one another. So maybe business can lead. So to close, I believe Canadian businesses hold the keys to jobs and prosperity. And with just a little support and a lot of cheering, I think we can really deliver for Canadians. We have a great opportunity for having a great competitive advantage in oil and gas, in mining. 25% of the TSX is oil and gas companies. Half of the GDP growth in the country in the next 20 years is going to come from developing our resources. It's of national importance. It's not a provincial importance. We have the chance in certain technology areas, financial services, to be world leaders. We should not let that opportunity go to others. It's a very competitive world. We can play. We just want a little cheerleading. I'm 30 seconds early. Thank you.